Hello, I'm Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute at Washington State University. And on behalf of the Institute, I wanna welcome you out to our continuing series on the 2020 election. Each week between now and election day on November 3rd, we will be bringing you lectures by some of the country's leading political experts about various aspects of the campaign and the election. I wanna thank the College of Arts and Sciences at Washington State University for their support of this series and their continued support of the Foley Institute. All of these events are, uh, are being uh, live streamed to our YouTube station where they are free and open to the public. Uh, you can see them live or you can also view them there later at your convenience. If you'd like more information about this series or about other programs at the Foley Institute, I encourage you to like us on Facebook or to go to our website foley.wsu.edu. So today's event is going to examine the role of conspiracy theories in the upcoming election. From the so-called Obamagate conspiracy, to plots that link Bill Gates to the coronavirus outbreak, to schemes involving philanthropist George Soros secretly funding Antifa protesters, to QAnon believers who think that President Trump is saving us from a satanic pedophile cabal that controls the world. This election season is full of dark and oftentimes outright absurd conspiratorial politics. Indeed, an NBC poll just last month found that a majority of Americans worried that, the, uh, that uh, there may be conspiracies to rig the upcoming election. So why are so many Americans embracing conspiratorial thinking about politics today? And is it worse than in the past? Who believes these oftentimes irrational plots and intrigues and why? And should we be concerned that conspiratorial politics will undermine our election and our democracy? Well, fortunately, we have the perfect speaker to address some of these questions today. Joe Yusinski is an associate professor of political science at the University of Miami. His research focuses on public opinion and mass media with a special emphasis on conspiratorial theories and disinformation. He is the co-author of American Conspiracy Theories published by Oxford University Press in, in 2014 and the author of Conspiracy Theories, A Primer, also published by Oxford University Press just this year. Joe's scholarly research has been published in many uh, academic journals and he's also a frequent contributor to news outlets, including the Washington Post, The Guardian and The Atlantic. And I personally wanna thank Joe for uh, for appearing in our election series because he's previously spoken at the, uh, at the Foley Institute and it's really a, a pleasure to have him back with us. Dr. Yusinski is gonna speak for about 30 to 40 minutes after which we'll have some time for discussion. Uh, and I encourage you if you have questions to send those to me via email at T.S. Foley, that is Tom S. Foley, T.S. Foley at WSU.edu. So, Joe, I'm going to turn the time over to you now, and I'll be back uh, in a little while uh, with some questions from our audience. Okay, well, thank you so much. If I'm up and running, um, then I'll, we'll just begin. So, um, this is my... Let's see. So, this is the topic of my talk, is social media and conspiracy theories. And... Uh, I am in uh, Coral Gables, uh, Florida right now, where I am a professor at the University of Miami, as Cornell said. So thank you very much for having me. And uh, I have been to Pullman before, and it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience. And I hope to get back out there again soon. So what am I going to talk about for the next uh, 30, 40 minutes or so? So I'm going to focus on... Uh, what is a conspiracy theory? What do the latest polls say about conspiracy beliefs? Uh, why are those beliefs popular or not so popular? And then I'm gonna go a little bit meta and go beyond what we've been reading in the headlines. And I'm gonna focus on uh, what's wrong with the popular discussions of these beliefs. What are we getting wrong in the media? Um, how, how are we believing the wrong things about people believing the wrong things? And what are the dangers of believing the wrong things about how people believe sometimes the wrong things? Uh, the research I'm going to present to you has been collected over the last couple of years, and it's in collaboration with my University of Miami ULINK team. Uh, we are focusing on the dangers of misinformation online and how it spreads through networks and with Adam Enders of University of Louisville. 
So before I begin, uh, conspiracy theories are a touchy topic uh, for everybody. Um, and when I was growing up, people said, you know, don't talk about politics or religion because you'll only get into fights with people. I would add conspiracy theories to that list of things not to discuss. So let me just begin by saying no offense intended. Um, we are all trying to make sense of a crazy world. Uh, we don't always have firsthand experience with everything that's going on. So we have to do our, our best to estimate or guesstimate the things that are going on in politics, the things that are going on outside of our immediate purview. Um, and sometimes we're going to come to conspiracy beliefs about the world around us. Uh, power and truth are difficult topics to navigate, to understand, and to discuss. And of course, real conspiracies do happen, and they happen too often. And it's important that we be vigilant uh, to, to keep them from happening, or if they do happen, to punish the wrongdoers. Everyone's guilty of believing conspiracy theories, um, and everyone's guilty of spreading them too. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but nobody really has their hands clean when it comes to uh, conspiracy theories. So the best way I think we need to think about this is, is about having sympathy and compassion for other people and uh, trying to be open-minded with each other um, as, far as, as far as that can go. And I do want to say this, I get a lot of e emails in my inbox telling me I'm one of them, I'm trying to shut down dissent or trying to uh, shill for the corporations or the deep state or the cabal, whoever the cabal is. I, I swear that I'm not one of them. And um, I may not be able to prove I'm not one of them, but I know myself that I'm not. So uh, please take my word. I'm not one of them, whoever them is. So uh, just to begin, what is a conspiracy theory? Um, you know, just to get our, our facts or excuse me, our definition straight. So a conspiracy theory, um, you know, we've seen many of these lately. And if we were just looking back at the last four months, there's all sorts of weird, wacky ones that have made headlines or that we've likely seen on social media. So um, just to begin, I think one of one of the funniest ones was was started in March, and it was the idea that uh, COVID was really a hoax uh, in order to hide the fact that Trump was rescuing thousands and thousands of children from underneath Central Park in New York from the deep state satanic baby eating sex trafficking cabal. And that these children were called mole children. And uh, you could see here a picture that a QAnon supporter had posted on Twitter saying, these are the camps where they've, they've brought in the mole children from the underground tunnels. Please pray for the mole children returning to the light with their unspeakable trauma. Of course, you know, there's no real evidence that there are mole children or that the satanic cabal exists. Uh, but this wound up getting quite a few likes and shares on, on social media. This mole children theory morphed more recently into the idea that Wayfair Furniture Company was selling children um, because they accidentally advertised some of their uh, uh, furniture with really high prices, like $20,000 for, a, for a, a, a closet. And the conspiracy theorists decided that they must be selling children inside the furniture and that's why the prices are so high. There's no evidence that that's true, obviously. Um, and we'll return to this a little bit later, uh, but a lot of people got into it. Um, we've seen other conspiracy theories about Bill Gates, George Soros come up in the last few months that they're behind the virus, that 5G technology is secretly spreading the virus, that Bill Gates is gonna stick with, with a microchip vaccine, um, that all of this that we've been living through through the past five months is just a big pharma scam. Um, so all sorts of things out there. And if we were just to, to concentrate on what's happening now, we'd say, oh my God, you know, we're living in the age of conspiracy theories. Um, so, but the question is, are we really? So as we get through the talk, we'll, we'll sort of answer that. And, and just to preview my answer, what I'm gonna say is there's more continuity than there is change, no matter how wacky the stuff is that we, we've been hearing about. So, just to define two of my terms that I'm most concerned with, the first is conspiracy and the second is conspiracy theory. Um, a conspiracy is a, is, is a small group operating in secret for their own benefit against the common good 
and in a way that violates our bedrock ground rules against widespread force and fraud. So in this sort of sense, I'm not talking about a conspiracy to knock over an ice cream truck or to, to hold up the 7-Eleven. I'm talking about something that undermines our basic ground rules. Um, we accept conspiracies like Watergate here as real um, because the appropriate knowledge generating bodies have said so. And they've done so with open data and with experts to verify that open data. So how do we know Watergate happened? Congress held hearings, the FBI investigated, there's been open admissions in court, the data is available for anyone to go and see. So we know it's real. And uh, other uh, conspiracies that are real include Tuskegee, you know, where people were injected in their eyes and spines with syphilis and not told for decades, or Iran-Contra, where there was shady dealings um, going on, uh, trading arms to hostile nations um, in violation of the law. Conspiracy theory is a little bit different. So you still have the same idea, except it's a accusatory perception rather than a real thing. So it's the accusatory perception that a small group is operating in secret for its own benefit against the common good in a way that violates our bedrock ground rules against force and fraud. Now, conspiracy theory, we don't take it as true, but we take it as it could be true. So again, it's an accusatory perception it hasn't been verified by the appropriate expert bodies with open data and evidence. But on the other end, it's not necessarily false either. It could be true. We just aren't sure yet. And, and generally what I like to say is that every conspiracy theory has a better than 0% probability of being, of being true. It's just it hasn't reached an appropriate burden of proof yet. Now, just because there's some evidence for a conspiracy theory doesn't mean that we should believe it. Just because there's cracks in an official story doesn't mean we should believe in a conspiracy theory. Those aren't good, good um, those don't provide good warrant to believe in conspiracy theories. So instead, what I would encourage people to do is wait until the majority of appropriate experts say that something is true before you believe it's true. There are an infinite number of conspiracy theories out there. You can go on uh, social media, 3 a.m., and you'll find all sorts of weird stuff floating around. Uh, much of it is here today and gone tomorrow. Uh, very few of the conspiracy theories that people concoct stick around for a long time. Most won't have books or TV shows or movies made about them. Uh, most won't even get pulled on. Um, but in that sense, it's very much like fan fiction, where anyone can make up anything they want, anytime they want, to serve any purpose they want. So you wind up with infinite conspiracy theories and an infinite number of each of those. So examples go from the obvious ones that many of us are familiar with, like the CIA killed Kennedy, the moon landing was faked, um, the Illuminati or the Freemasons or the lizard people are the ones who really control the world. Um, so there are no official versions of any conspiracy theory. And again, if you ask conspiracy theorists who are engaging in the same exact theory, they will all have different versions of, of, of what they believe. Conspiracy theories surround almost everything, every, every event and circumstance, there'll be somebody coming up with a conspiracy theory about it somewhere. But they, we tend to notice them more when they attach to salient events that we're paying attention to. And that's very much what has happened with um, COVID because we're all focusing on one thing. So of course the conspiracy theorists are too, um, so it looks like there's tons of conspiracy theorists about this, where it's really just the conspiracy-minded people are focusing on something that we're all focusing on. So how popular are these theories? Um, so just to start with COVID conspiracy theories, um, I sort of lucked out when the pandemic started. I had a poll about to go into the field in the first uh, two weeks of March. So I threw on some COVID questions and the first one I asked matched up with what President Trump was saying was that this is the Democrats new hoax. So we asked if the threat of COVID was being exaggerated to hurt President Trump politically. And we wound up with 29% of Americans agreeing that that's true. We also asked if COVID was something of a bioweapon that it was created or spread on purpose. And that had been hinted at gently by Senator Tom Cotton and a whole lot of other people on, on social media. Um, and we got about 31% of Americans agreeing with that idea. And those are the two big ideas floating around 
COVID uh, in terms of conspiracy theories, that it's exaggerated to hurt Trump or it's a bioweapon to hurt people in general. Those numbers have stayed largely uh, stable. So I've been polling on this repeatedly. And my last poll went out in March, or excuse me, this, this data is from March. My last poll went out in June. I had the exact same numbers. And then I'll be sending the polls out again in about a couple of weeks. And I expect that I'll probably have the same things again. So looking at other conspiracy theories, ones that are more longstanding, um, these are what the numbers look like. So if we start um, over on the right-hand side with the least believed, um, was the number of uh, Jewish people killed in the Holocaust exaggerated? We get about 15% agreeing with that. And again, these numbers are from March, um, national samples of uh, representative samples of Americans. Uh, school shootings, um, like at uh, Parkland and at Sandy Hook, are those faked as part of a false flag operation? About 16%. Is climate change a hoax? Uh, 22% is 5G have dangers that are being covered up. That's about 25%. One in three Americans believe that uh, government is covering up alien landings. Uh, about 42% think there's an unaccountable deep state really running the government. Was JFK uh, killed by a conspiracy rather than a lone gunman? About 44%. The true dangers of GMO foods being covered up? About 45%. Was Jeffrey Epstein murdered to cover up what he knows, 50%. And then does the 1% control the economy and the government for their own benefit, uh, about 54%. Um, so a lot of people believe conspiracy theories. Some of these are majority beliefs. Um, some of them are not. Um, when I share these numbers with people, they tend to be shocked that many of them get as, as, as wide numbers as they do. But what, what this tells you is that everyone believes conspiracy theories. Because there's an infinite number out there, an infinite number of each of those, um, we can't ask about all of them. But when we can ask about a bunch, what we find is that the more and more we ask about, the fewer and fewer people believe in zero. So in March, I asked about 23 conspiracy theories on my, on my poll of Americans, and 91% believed in at least one. Polls that have asked about seven still get majorities believing at least one. So you can imagine if you ask about 100 or 200, there's not going to be anyone in a poll who's not going to believe at least one of them. So a better way to think about this isn't believers and non-believers. It's much better to think about it as uh, people existing along a continuum where um, some people are going to believe a lot, some people are going to believe a couple, and some people will believe very few. So why do people believe conspiracy theories? So there have been hundreds of factors identified. In the last 12 years, there's been a, a, a lot of social psychologists, uh, political scientists, sociologists, uh, working on the topic, polling, uh, doing psychological experiments on people to find out what drives these beliefs. And I would love to give you something a little more specific, but the answer is there's a lot of reasons. And largely because the question of why do people believe conspiracy theories really devolves down to why do people believe anything? And the answer is for lots of different reasons. Um, and this is going to vary from conspiracy theory to conspiracy theory, and it's going to vary by person and over time. So keeping in mind that conspiracy theory is a really big bucket of ideas. So the reason why somebody might believe in a JFK conspiracy theory is gonna be very different than the factors driving someone to believe in Holocaust denial conspiracy theories. And we also have to keep in mind that conspiracy theory is just one of a bunch of different kinds of dubious ideas, right? So um, beliefs in paranormal or supernatural ideas um, or miracle cure ideas that have been floating around lately um, they're not all conspiracy theories, but they may be driven by some of the same factors driving conspiracy theories. So what I would say is that um, there isn't going to be just one factor that explains everything. And what I'll try to do in the next few slides is sort of give you the best predictors that I found in my research, keeping in mind that as you read about the topic, you'll find that there's always some new thing that people are going to say drives conspiracy beliefs. 
So the prominent factors that I identify in my research are two latent dispositions. So two predispositions that people have. And the first is conspiracy thinking. So what I've identified in people using my survey data over the last 10 years is that some people have a disposition to view events and circumstances generally as part of, uh, as, as the products of ongoing shadowy conspiracies. So just as one person might look at an event and say, well, you know, this is caused by, you know, whatever factor, somebody else with high levels of conspiracy thinking will say, well, everything's caused by a conspiracy, a conspiracy. So this event is caused by a conspiracy too. It's just how they see the world. Now, where that comes from, we don't fully know yet, but we do know that, that this disposition is fairly stable in people. So when they start thinking about new events and circumstances, they apply that worldview to those events and circumstances. And unsurprisingly, they say, well, it must be a conspiracy that's driving it. The second one is denialism. And this is the idea that uh, some people have an antagonistic relationship with authoritative information. So that when people see th stuff that they don't necessarily agree with, even if it's authoritative information, they'll say, well, I just don't believe it. So they're not gonna buy into official accounts very easily. Another issue here that we see quite a bit lately is partisan group attachments. And in these manifest through two mechanisms and one is through motivated reasoning and the other is through cues coming from political and media elites. So you can imagine if something's gonna hurt your party, it's very easy to say, well, that's a conspiracy brought on by the other party and you can reason it away. And elite cues work where you're gonna trust things said by your own party and then distrust things said by the other party. Now these factors, the conspiracy thinking, the denialism the, and the partisan group attachments are all gonna be operating in the same people at the same time to varying degrees. And even on top of those, um, people are going to be exposed to all sorts of different sets of information, which are going to affect them in varying ways, um, which they're going to have to deal with. And they have their own imaginations too, which they can make up stuff um, whenever they want. So a very simple model to think about this is that when people are out in the world, they have information coming in. Um, they use their existing dispositions, their conspiracy thinking, their denialism, and their partisan motivations um, to interpret all those information inputs. And that's what then leads to a belief about any specific object. So what predicts COVID-19 beliefs? So imagine you're at the pub hanging out with these three uh, fellas right here, and we'll name the first guy partisanship, the second guy will just call him denialism and the third guy will call him conspiracy thinking. And we're all watching the news about COVID from the pub and, and they're all trying to make sense of it. So the first guy partisanship is watching the news and he goes, well, the news is all biased against my party. So I'm not gonna believe anything they say. This is, this is just a conspiracy. The second guy says, well, you know, I don't believe anything the news says anyway. I don't even know I'm watching it. They're all liars. And the third guy says, well, um, th this is all some sort of conspiracy against us. You know, everything's a conspiracy. So you can imagine how different people are going to interpret the world given this set of dispositions. And if any of you have a, a Thanksgiving get together with your extended family, you may have an uncle that matches each of these personalities uh, rather closely. Um, so with that data that I had from March, where I asked people, you know, do you think the threat of COVID is being exaggerated? Do you think it's being spread on purpose? What we found was that conspiracy thinking really was the big predictor of uh, people believing that COVID was spread on purpose. Um, denialism was a moderate predictor of both, thinking that it was spread on purpose and exaggerated and being a Republican was a fairly strong predictor of thinking the threat was exaggerated. And that makes sense because if you think it's being exaggerated to hurt Trump in an election year, then obviously that's gonna be more Republicans buying into that because of their partisan motivations um, than their other things. So, moving on to the next slide. 
Um, can elites focus these effects? And, and the answer is yes, most certainly. So what we've seen during COVID is that Trump started out saying that COVID-19 was the Democrats' new hoax. And then like-minded uh, media elites started chiming in on the same thing. We had Rush Limbaugh saying that uh, our public health officials are actually part of the deep state. It's not actually clear if um, uh, Dr. Fauci is a member of the deep state or even a real doctor. Uh, you've had Fox News personalities uh, tweet out things saying, you know, people should go and record their hospitals because it's not actually clear that they have any real COVID patients. Um, this is all faked. Um, so it, it should not come as any surprise that these cues coming from elites have driven people to buy into these conspiracy theories, particularly those on the right. So why do people believe these theories? Again, lots of reasons. Um, people can make them up too. Um, but the, the simplest, simplest model I like to say is that people get information, they load, it over, they load it over their existing dispositions, and that will lead them to accept or resist any given conspiracy theory that they might concoct or come into contact with. But what's important to, to realize here is that people just don't blindly accept any conspiracy theory that they, that they see. Um, so rather, what we find is that people will seek out information that matches what they already believe and then discount things that don't match what they already believe. So what are the harms of these beliefs? Well, simply put, you know, first of all, people can act on their beliefs. So if you think that COVID is a hoax, you are not going to act as if it's not. So you, you may not engage in frequent hand washing. Um, you may not engage in social distancing or mask wearing. An opposite belief, thinking that it's a bioweapon, um, what we're finding is that it leads people, particularly earlier on in the pandemic, to hoard vital stuff because they think people are trying to kill them. So they're going out and buying all the toilet paper and all the food and you wind up with, with shortages. So depending on your conspiracy belief can lead you to different actions. These beliefs can also drive people to have downstream um, attitudes. So for example, if you're exposed to a lot of conspiracy theories and you start to buy into them, you might say, well, I'm just not gonna trust government or institutions or corporations anymore because I keep hearing so much bad stuff about them. But the important thing is, I mean, it's, it's clear that, that beliefs that are not tethered to our reality can drive people to act in a way that's dangerous, but we need to get the causal locus right here. Um, governments across the world are legislating social media and, inter and internet content now. And there's a big push by, by people um, to get Congress to start legislating the content on Facebook and Twitter. A lot of people think this is a good idea, um, but what if conspiracy theorizing and other unsavory ideas haven't increased lately? Uh, what if they haven't increased due to social media? What if the levels of all of these things are exactly the same as they've been from before social media? What if the real problem is, is, is that this is just a human condition? Some people believe conspiracy theories and the information sources don't matter. And what if, what if the big driver of this isn't social media uh, uh, companies or not regular people sharing ideas with each other on social media, but rather the mainstream media and rather our political elites who are pushing conspiracy theories and spreading them far more than any, any person on Twitter or Facebook. Would it be smart then to give the power to control social media to the people who are one, you know, most likely to want to cover up their own misdeeds and to, um, also spreading their own conspiracy theories? I would say no. So let's start with the first question. Are Americans more conspiratorial now than they have been in the past? This is what the headlines say. You know, these are typical headlines. You're living in the golden age of conspiracy theories. The Trump era is the golden age of conspiracy theories on the right and the left. And I could bring you hundreds of examples of this. But here's the thing. I did this in my 2014 book. Um, before Trump even came along and found that journalists are putting these headlines out every year, going back decades. So it can't always be true. And, and none of these claims are ever made with any systematic data. So they're just journalists licking their thumb, putting it to the wind and say, well, now feels like the time. 
without any evidence to back up the claims. So what evidence can we bring to bear? Well, first of all, I've been polling a lot of conspiracy theories for the last eight years. Um, and in my own polling, I'm finding that a couple have gone up a little bit, beliefs and a few others have flatlined and a few others have gone down. So to give you an example of one that's gone down, I mean, JFK beliefs were started out at around 50% in 1963. By the mid seventies, they were 80% of Americans buying into JFK conspiracy theories. They've only come down since the advent of the internet. And now they're almost about half where they were um, in the 1970s. So the important point there is no internet needed for a conspiracy theory about the Kennedy assassination to hit four out of five Americans, 80%, which is higher than any conspiracy theory I've pulled on in the internet era. And it's only come down since the internet era. Um, so we are not finding evidence of conspiracy beliefs going up across the board. Uh, generalized conspiracy thinking, which I've, I've already discussed, I've been measuring since 2012, and I found largely it's stable. It went up a tiny, tiny bit in 2016, but since that time, we haven't found any increases. So essentially, we're not finding increases in beliefs across the board in conspiracy theories going up, and we're not finding increase in the disposition to believe conspiracy theories going up over time. So to me, that's fairly powerful evidence that um, things aren't really changing, um, whether it's for social media or not. We've heard a lot about QAnon, so let me give you a, a very specific example here. What about QAnon? Well, this is what the headlines say. Washington Post says, QAnon is scary because it's getting bigger and we don't know how to stop it. Uh, we're going down the rabbit hole, says the Guardian. QAnon uh, conspiracy theories thrive on Facebook. QAnon blew up because of a huge internet problem. Uh, QAnon, the theory spawned by a Trump quip got big and scary, and I could list a hundred headlines from the last couple of weeks that say this exact thing. It's mainstream, it's devouring America, it's taken over the Republican Party, it's massive, and everyone believes QAnon um, if you only listen to the headlines. But what do the data say? Well, I started polling on this in, in the summer of 2018 after Q QAnon got a lot of media coverage. And I put it on a, a feeling thermometer where I said between zero and 100, um, how much do you like QAnon? with zero being you really hate it and 100 being you really like it. So, and I, I ran this poll in, in, in Florida. The average rating of 2000 Floridians of QAnon was about a 24, which for comparison only puts a, a few points ahead of Fidel Castro, who we put on there just, just as a comparison. If you know anything about Florida, you know we don't like Castro here. People danced in the streets when he died. Um, five points better than Castro, the most reviled leader in, in world leader in Florida, um, over time, that number has not caught up. So I've been running that same poll, both in Florida and nationwide for the last two years, and I found no increase. So it floats right around 25. So no increase on the, on the average rating of the zero to 100 scale. What we found is that it's equal support from people both identifying on the left and the right, and other polls find the exact same thing. So last August of 2019, Emerson polling found that it was about 5% of Americans said they believed in QAnon. So they were asked flat, flat out, yes or no, do you believe QAnon? 5% said yes. 6% um, of, of Republicans and 6% of Democrats said yes. So again, equal between right and left. Pew polled this past March, um, found that 75% of Americans knew, quote, nothing at all about it around 20 some odd percent said they knew a little bit about it and 3% said they knew a lot about it. So for these headlines saying, oh my God, it's huge and taking over the country, there's just been no evidence to back that up. Um, so the headlines about this just are not supported. So what is the role of the internet? I mean, I, I guess one thing I wanna point out is when we talk about the internet, we use some words without really defining them very much. And these are terms that we need to think about. And one is spread. So I said the internet spreads ideas. Well, when you mean spread, do you mean anyone can access it anywhere? Yes, that's true. 
does it mean that it's really changing minds because people are accessing it and adopting that information into their worldview? Well, that's a very different thing. And we need to think through those ideas before we start saying the internet is spreading things everywhere. So the literature on, on how the media affects people's views doesn't really match up with how the media talks about this and how a lot of people think about um, internet uh, influence. So one, uh, belief in conspiracy theories isn't consistently going up and I'm not finding evidence that it's been going up in the internet era. The forces that drive people uh, to believe in conspiracy theories exist regardless of modern technologies. People have been sharing these ideas or making them up um, going back hundreds of years, whether it was you know, witches conspiring with Satan um, during the witch trials or the Illuminati panic of 300 years ago or the Freemason panic of 200 years ago or the Red Scares of the last century. These things have been going on. No internet needed. Political elites and legacy mainstream media still are big culprits of this. And as much as the mainstream media likes to say they're the barrier between us and conspiracy beliefs, they push a lot of these beliefs too. I mean, the Animal Planet channel, which I thought was about real animals, uh, their biggest shows are Bigfoot and mermaid conspiracy theories. Washington Post has been running a lot of alien UFO stories. Um, History Channel, alien conspiracy theories. I thought it was about real history. Not anymore. Um, previous decades may have been actually worse in terms of the impact of conspiracy theories in our politics. I mean, we've been doing 100 years of media effects research since the 1920s. And that research largely says, yes, there's some effects of the media on what people think, but it's not as huge and impactful as sometimes um, you know, we think it is. And, and this brings up some other points, and is that we have libraries in our own pockets now. Why is it that only the conspiracy theories are driving everyone to believe them, but all other information doesn't have an effect on us? I mean, that's sort of an interesting question. Um, even though we thought, you know, the fake news and the conspiracy theories vastly um, impacted the 2016 election. Studies that have gone back and looked at this find that they didn't really influence many people. It was people self-selecting what they already believed and then voting in a way they were already gonna vote anyway. So at the end of the day, people still have to access this stuff. They have to seek it out purposely, access it, and then accept it. And that's, that's harder than it, than it first appears. So a lot of what we're seeing here is an optical illusion. You know, we can track these conversations now that we have on social media in a way they haven't before. But we're often confusing being able to see this chatter on social media with the idea that it's actually new. You know, we couldn't always see what was taking place at the water cooler, but now we can. We're paying attention to the elites engaging in this rhetoric like Trump, because um, he's doing it a lot. Um, but we shouldn't confuse his rhetoric with what the mass public believes. These are very different things. And journalists are reporting on this topic far more than they ever did in the past, but we shouldn't confuse media attention with um, what people are believing in the mass public. So are Republicans likely to believe conspiracy theories more? Well, there are high profile examples of Republican elites engaging in conspiracy rhetoric and Republican masses buying into conspiracy theories, whether it's the COVID is exaggerated or the climate change is, is fake. And we could find instances of this where elites are driving these beliefs. But if we apply an even-handed definition of conspiracy theories to, um, you, you know, to political rhetoric, then we find that there are people on the left, elites, who engage in this just as much as people on the right. Bernie Sanders runs his campaign around the idea that the 1% controls everything. There's not good evidence to support that. And if you look at his rhetoric, it is highly conspiratorial. And he got just as much of the vote from his side as Donald Trump got from his side in 2016. So in the mass public, there are many conspiracy theories equally believed by left and right, whether it's Epstein, JFK conspiracy theories, and voter fraud going into any election. Um, AIDS spread on purpose. Conspiracy theories are believed by people equally left and right. But there are some believed more than uh, people on the left than by the right. The idea that Trump conspired with Russia. 
or the idea that uh, um, Republicans are conspiring against us right now or corporations in the 1% are working against us right now. That's all believe more by the left. The mechanisms that drive this operate on the left just as much as they do on the right and conspiracy thinking when we measure it is equal between left and right. So are these ideas for people on the extremes? Well, it depends what we mean by extremist and it depends what we mean by political. It's gonna come largely down to what type of conspiracy theory are we talking about? Um, is it partisan or is it largely nonpartisan? So we might say that it's extreme polarization that's driving people to conspiracy theories, but only in the sense that if you're a strong Republican, you listen to Republican elites and if a, a Republican elites engage in conspiracy theories and you listen to them and trust them, then you'll adopt that language. You'll adopt those ideas. But absent that, absent partisan or ideological content, people on the right and left or even extreme people on the right and left aren't gonna adopt Rothschild, Freemason, vaccine, GMO or Holocaust conspiracy theories. That's gonna be largely people who are somewhat detached from, the, uh, from regular ideology and the party system. So analyzing data about QAnon, what we're finding is that conspiracy thinking, um, which I've already discussed, combined with other antisocial personality traits um, like sociopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism are what's really driving beliefs and things like QAnon. So when people say QAnon is a far-right belief, well, I find no evidence of that. People on the left are just as likely to believe it. Um, but what I'm really finding the big predictors are, 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 are dark personality traits. And that makes sense. If you can hold on to a belief that says Hillary Clinton is a satanic baby eater um, who's running a massive sex trafficking operation, um, then you probably have some dark traits going on in your personality that allow you to hold on to those beliefs. Um, if you're someone who, who can engage with the idea and be convinced of it, that there are children being sold by a mainstream furniture company out in the open in a mass sex trafficking elite operation, then you probably have some, some bits of narcissism and other things going on now. So is any of this new? And I guess this is the good message here is the answer is uh, no. I mean, COVID, the COVID conspiracy theories that we've been exposed to in the last few years, or excuse me, in the last five months, um, are the same theories we've always been engaging with over time, just different nouns is what I like to say. So instead of AIDS being created in a lab, it's COVID. Instead of George Soros and the Koch brothers and the Rothschilds working against us, now it's Bill Gates. Um, so it's the same theories, just different nouns adopted to new circumstances, but it's mostly the same stuff. So to conclude very quickly, conspiracy theories can be troublesome. Uh, we should want ours and others' beliefs to be tethered, tethered to the best evidence. Um, when it's not the case, then people, people can engage in bad action. Um, but the good news is there's more continuity than change in this conspiracy thinking is an old human problem and it seems like a constant. We shouldn't be blaming new technology for it. And the mechanisms that I find to be driving it the most our longstanding dispositions. If you want further reading on the topic, check out my latest book called Conspiracy Theories of Primer, which is a short, very easy to read text. If you're interested in uh, um, converting people out of their conspiracy theories, check out Mick West's book, Escaping the Rabbit Hole. If you want to debunk conspiracy theories, look at Conspiracy Theories or Conspiracies Declassified by Dunning. And if you're interested in psychology, look at Rob Brotherton's Suspicious Minds. And I've run just a few minutes over, but I'll be happy to take any questions for the, la for the next uh, 16 minutes. Okay, well, thanks, Joe. That's re really interesting. I got lots of questions to ask. I'm gonna start off though, asking you, uh, how do you think uh, conspiracy theory belief in the United States compares with uh, other nations? Are we more conspiratorial in, in America? So the interesting thing is that we are exceptional in many, many ways, but our conspiracy theorizing is not one of those ways. So um, if you go back in history, I mean, our founding is based on conspiracy theories. Read the first few paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence, best political prose ever written. And then you get into a bunch of nutty conspiracy theories about the king, a lot of it which had to be edited out by Ben Franklin 
um, because they didn't want to appear too paranoid. Um, but even with that, you know, you can poll um, across countries and you find that, that we're on average and somewhat on par with other Western countries like the UK and Germany. Some are less, like Sweden, um, and there are some are more. If you go to the Middle, Middle Eastern countries, you'll find that, that there are higher levels. But again, it's going to depend on what you're polling on specifically and, and when you do it. Um, so we're not the most. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, that's good news, I suppose. So, so Raphael Aguilar asks a question, um, where can you go to get good information? You know, if you hear a conspiracy theory, you're wondering whether it's true or not. Is there some place you can go to get good information? And I, I want to link that question with another question from Jim Castrolang, who asks, you know, he says, uh, you know, we should... In, before we believe a conspiracy theory, we should wait until the experts weigh in and, and validate it in some way. Um, but, but who are those experts we should wait for? And maybe they're the ones in on the conspiracy theory. So, so I guess this question is how do we validate a conspiracy theory or, or, or not? So in any given area, I would look to the experts in that area. So if somebody said there's a conspiracy that involves physics, I wanna hear the majority of physicists not sociologists. If, I, if, if you wanna hear um, expert information in any given domain, go to the experts in that domain who should be judging it. And particularly experts who have access to the best available data and who, are, who make that data available to everyone else for refutation. So the second question is, can the experts be in on it? Sure, experts can lie. Sometimes experts can just get it wrong by accident too. But the answer to that isn't conspiracy theories, it's more experts. So I tend to put a lot of stock in experts when the experts put out their data and their methods so anyone can see it and challenge it and refute it. And then once you get to a consensus, then it becomes much more solid to me. So just because there's something out there doesn't mean you have to believe it. You could say, listen, it could be true and I'm gonna wait for more evidence. And then you wait. Um, but there's no reason to jump to a conspiracy theory right off. And I think one of my favorite places to go, if I see something on Facebook that seems weird, then Snopes is a good one um, and, and generally a good starting place. Okay, great. So uh, several people, uh, Marsha Garrett asked, you know, does conspiracy theory belief correlate with education levels? And uh, Paul Quay asked, does it correlate with different age levels? Are older people more likely to believe in conspiracy theories, less educated people more likely to believe in them or not? What about those types of factors? So the big factors driving underlying conspiracy thinking or the disposition to see conspiracies everywhere. Uh, the two big factors are income and education. But why that is, it's not entirely clear. So it could be the case that people get more educated and they eschew conspiracy thinking. It could be the case that, that institutions of higher education eschew conspiracy theorists. I mean, if somebody emailed me and said, hey, I wanna work with you to find out who really blew up the Twin Towers on 9-11, I probably wouldn't write them back. Um, so it could be going in both directions, same way if you make more money, it could make you feel more comfortable and be like, well, I don't think there's conspiracies out to get us. I'm doing fairly well. Could also be the case that jobs that pay a lot of money aren't going to hire raving conspiracy theorists. So if you said we got to hire a stock manager, you're not going to hire someone who thinks everything's rigged against them. Um, but those are the factors. Why that is, we're not entirely sure. Okay. So Anastasia Telesetsky asks, um, you know, it might not be the case that there's more conspiracy theories, but they are disseminated more frequently on social because of social media now. Is there any evidence that because of that frequent dissemination, there's greater violence associated with uh, uh, conspiracy theories today? Well, think about it this way. If are they really disseminated more than they used to be? I mean, I'm not finding any conspiracy theory that's as popular as ones that were disseminated prior to social media. I mean, JFK hit 80% within 10 years of the assassination. I haven't found a conspiracy theory that's hit 80% 80, 80 in, the, in the last um, 10 years and that we've been living in the social media age. So, I mean, the information's out there for anyone who wants it, but that was the same way before social media. You could go to the library and find all sorts of JFK conspiracy books or conspiracy books on any topic. Um, people were more than happy to discuss these things. I mean, we were talking and... You know, so people were not impeded from sharing these ideas before social media. 
it, it makes it easier. But the interesting thing is that we have our blinders and our, our filters that keep things from coming in that we don't really want there. So, you know, I get called by journalists all the time and they say, well, this new conspiracy theory is on Twitter and everyone's going to see it and everyone's going to believe it. And I said, well, did you see it? They say, yeah. And I said, well, you must believe it then. And they say, no, not me. I said, well, what makes you so special? You know, what's your superpower? And the answer is, is that if, if someone's not already inclined to access and believe something, they're just not going to, regardless of, of whether it can be accessed um, on your phone or not. I wonder if there's anything uh, sort of unique in this particular moment, because we do have uh, a, a number of very popular websites like InfoWars that are all mm. about conspiracy theories. And they have formal and informal links with a president who, by any measure, uh, uh, embraces conspiracy theories more than any recent major politician in, in our history. Mm. And so you get this cycle where a conspiracy theory may begin on InfoWars, it's then picked up by uh, Trump on Twitter, and then it becomes, it obviously has to become mainstream media cover, uh, covered as well after that. So I wonder if that's a, if there's something unique going on today. So yeah, and that unique thing is Trump. So I mean, InfoWars existed, but Obama wasn't retweeting InfoWars, right? So this is very much a Trump phenomenon. I mean, if you look at web traffic, and, and I've been following InfoWars web traffic for a while. I mean, they rank around 300 to 500 in terms of their ranking of traffic in the country. Whereas the mainstream news sites like the New York Times are usually in the top 20. So people are getting their information from mainstream sources long before they're going um, to InfoWars to get stuff. And the real problem here is just the legacy things. It's the political elites like Trump who engage in this rhetoric. He's chosen to do so. That's what he does to put his coalition together. Um, and, and he'll link with places like InfoWars because they're reaching out to the same audience for him. But I mean, that's the answer isn't to censor the internet or social media. It's to get a better president. <laughs> okay. So Derek Kirchmeier, he, he says, you know, you talk a lot about how the mainstream media is hyping the idea that we're in this, this moment of conspiracy theories and they're running rampant right now. Is there any danger, and, and that's not really the case, is there any danger at, uh, as a result of that message coming from the mainstream media? Yeah, because to me, I mean, it's normalizing the idea that we should be censoring Facebook. And it's, it's taking our attention away from the real drivers of this. I mean, I agree with everyone. Um, and I think, and I think there are, you know, most of these folks' hearts are in the right place um, that, you know, we want people to have the best beliefs possible as closely tied to the available evidence as possible. And, and we want to do what we can to make sure that people believe good things and act on them. But saying that this is the internet driving it or it's some other factor driving it, we can get the causal locus very wrong and we can wind up putting power to censor our information environments into the hands of people who shouldn't have that power. Um, and we could be, you know, making it worse. So, I, I mean, a question that I have to ask is, you know, when they, when Congress has held hearings on this and they say, well, why isn't Facebook censoring um, what congressional candidates are saying on, on social media? Well, you know, why can't Congress control what their own members say? Why do they need Facebook to control congressional, congressional candidates and members of Congress? Why does Congress calling on Facebook to censor the president? You know, they could have taken action against them. They've just chosen not to. And they're just, they're just pushing this off onto, you know, how come Facebook doesn't do it? Well, that's not right. You know, politicians need to be responsible for their own for their own rhetoric and, and, and they could address this if they wanted to do. They're just choosing it not to and they wanna hand it off to a third party to act as if they're doing something. Okay, so Alex Hammond, who's a, a social scientist at WSU uh, has a, a technical question about the underlying polling. How, how's your underlying line polling done and what are the limitations on that on your polling research? So I've been polling for, for 10 years on these topics. Um, you got to take polls with a grain of salt. So what I do is I run multiple polls and I, I try to do them in different ways through different polling houses at varying times. And I try to um, 
use different question wordings to make sure that I'm getting to the right topic. So when it comes to something like QAnon, I'm fairly certain of my conclusions because what I'm finding is matching what other polling houses are finding who are asking different questions um, with different samples of people over time. Um, so I never put stock in one poll, one poll number, um, but when you've got a lot of polls telling a similar story, um, then, th then that's where I start to believe it. So there's a lot of people who are concerned about uh, the upcoming election and voter fraud. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what can you tell us about that? So I tend to poll every election in the two months prior and then a few weeks after the election. And you get about half the country thinks that there's going to be fraud in the upcoming election. So we'll ask a question. If your candidate doesn't win, do you think fraud would have been involved? And we get about a third of each party saying yes. After the election, we re-ask the question, and that number cuts in half because it's only the losers who think they were cheated. The winners think everything was hunky-dory, right? So that's why I tend to say this doesn't win me any points with conspiracy theorists, but I say conspiracy theories are for losers because the losing side, many of them often think they're cheated, and they'll say, well, it's not the fact that we didn't have a good candidate or couldn't convince people of our ideas. It's much easier to say we were cheated in politics as in sports. So, so I've had a... A couple of people ask me, how do we know you're not part of a conspiracy <laughs> yourself, part of the deep state? And also personally, do you believe in any conspiracy theories? I used to. When I was growing up, I was really into uh, the Oliver Stone JFK movie. And that was one of my favorite movies um, when it came out. Uh, but I teach a class on conspiracy theories every semester. So I show the movie incessantly. So I, the movie doesn't even stand on its own. And most of the stuff in it, even Oliver Stone says he made up out of whole cloth. So um, there's really nothing there. And having spent so much time on it, I mean, at this point, it's not that I don't believe conspiracy theories. It's just that I don't believe a lot of stuff. And, and for me to adopt something now, it's just it, it, it takes a lot of evidence um, to convince me of things, or at least I like to think. So, um, so Catherine Langston asks a question. Uh, Back in 2016, in a Washington Post article you wrote, you found a correlation between partisanship and belief in conspiratorial thinking. Uh, and yet in 2020, you say there is no, no linkage between or a correlation between partisanship and belief in the QAnon conspiracy. Um, what article is she referencing? Uh, it says... Um, in 2016 and August uh -huh. 2020, Washington Post articles, you ask respondents to agree or disagree with the same statement, big events like wars and current oh. recessions, blah, blah, blah. In 2016, you concluded that partisanship was the best predictor of that tendency to believe in conspiracy theories. But in 2020, you don't find that correlation with QAnon. Belief. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I ever found that. I mean, what I've, what I've found pretty consistently is there wasn't much of a, of a correlation between underlying conspiracy thinking and partisanship, but partisanship drives which conspiracy theories people will believe in. So Democrats will believe in different things than Republicans will. And it's usually the things that, you know, they like to point fingers at each other. So. Okay. Well, I'm afraid our time is about up now. Um, I want to remind our audience that uh, our next event uh, in our, our 2020 election series is going to be held next Tuesday, September 15th, uh, from, from noon to one. We have Julia Azaria from Marquette University, who, who will be talking about the Mueller investigation and the impeachment proceedings and how they may impact the 2020 election. Uh, I also want to note that we've added a new lecture uh, to our series. Uh, we have Chris Parker from the University of Washington, who's going to be talking about the role of protests and race in the election. Uh, his uh, discussion is going to be on Tuesday, September 22nd for, at noon to one. Uh, and so put those uh, both those events on your calendar. Now, um, I... I uh, I want to also remind all of you, if you want more information about this series or any of our events, you can um, like us on Facebook again or go to our, our website, foley.wsu.edu. And now I want to thank uh, Joe Yusinski uh, for uh, meeting with us today and a really excellent discussion about conspiracy theories and whether we should be worried about them or not. Thanks a lot, Joe. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. All right. We'll see you all next week.